taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. Today's event is being sponsored by the First Year Seminar Faculty Learning Community, along with University College. This idea exchange event emerged from a group of faculty teaching first year seminars who wanted more professional development and support in designing and leading instruction of these unique courses. We, members of the first year seminar faculty learning community, wanted a forum in which to bring together instructors from around campus who would like to share stories, reflections about what works and what doesn't, and ideas for future courses. We are thrilled to have you here, and we look forward to a productive and inspirational day. Members of the First Year Seminar Faculty Learning Group have name tags that look like this. So if you, if you have any questions, if you want more information about our group, feel free to ask us questions, or if there's anything we can do today to make your experience better, please let us know. And we have a poster and during the poster session time that has more information about our group if you'd like to, to learn about that. Um, a brief overview of your day. You can look in your uh, folder. We've got the agenda for the day. We also have a roster of everyone who is in attendance, so with emails, so that if you have some great conversations today and you'd like to get in touch with somebody, you have that. Uh, we also have an evaluation that we'll ask you to fill out at the end of the day so that we can get feedback and make changes for future events. And then also, um, Dr. Garner has put some handouts in there about his toolbox. He's gonna talk a little bit about that. There should have also been a card in there where you can actually sign up for this wonderful resource, but he'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the restrooms are located just outside of the door, and also be careful of the cords. We've put tables and there's tape and stuff, but be careful of that in the room. Um, and please help continue to help yourself this morning. We have water and some other breakfast items, so please continue to help yourself. We are so thankful for the support of University College to make this event possible. Now, it is my honor to introduce the Dean of University College and Associate Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education, Dr. Kathy Johnson. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson to bring you the Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Um, and let me echo Lisa's thanks to you for giving up time during a really busy month um, to make room for this professional development opportunity. I think it's wonderful that there are people, faculty, staff from nearly half of the undergraduate degree conferring schools on campus, which is just great. February is just a really crazy month. Um, I hate to put people on the spot, but I would ask that the members of the faculty learning community for the first year seminar experience please stand. And I would like to thank them for their leadership and for their organization. Thank you. Um, it's, it's amazing um, the energy and the enthusiasm that I've seen amongst this group and, and I've heard through um, hearsay as well as directly about the amazing conversations that I've had and just am so proud to be a member of this community and so grateful for you to take the time to lead in this way. Um, we were talking at dinner last night very briefly about kind of our first experiences teaching first year seminars. I, mean, I taught my first one in 1999, and the picture behind me is a great characterization of how I felt probably after my first class. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, you know, it sounded like a great idea. I was a pretty new assistant professor, maybe associate at the time. Um, I had done new student orientation for years um, when I was an undergraduate. In an RA, so I kind of had a bit of student affairs, and I thought it would be a really nice way of kind of melding that background together. And what I learned was that sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. And there was just nothing like this. There really wasn't much structure at the time, aside from wonderful Barbara Jackson, you know, giving me pep talks to really help me know how to do this better. Um, it's it's so. Um, such a matter of pride to me that, that this institution is recognized for its first year experience and we have such a wealth of data on how impactful first year seminars are um, to our first year students, especially when coupled with other high impact practices like think learning communities and summer bridge and things like that. Um, but, but I think it's a testimony for today that, that even though we're doing well, there's still a hunger um, to want to learn more, um, to figure out how to do this better. And I'm just so excited to be able to be here for 
the day and to share best practices. I look forward to the conversations, um, and I hope we all gain something from them. So thank you. Thank you, Dean Johnson. I would also like to thank Associate Dean Dr. Sarah Baker for all of her help and support. We are so grateful for both your support and faculty efforts to continually improve uh, first-year seminars across Canada. We are thrilled to have Dr. Brad Garner as our keynote speaker. He's not a stranger to our campus because he has shared his innovations with other groups and got excellent reviews. Dr. Garner serves as Director of Faculty Enrichment in the Center for Learning and Innovation at Indiana Wesleyan University. He has been actively involved for several years in directing and teaching the first year seminar on his campus. He is also a frequent presenter at conferences and workshops and has authored and co-authored several publications, including A Brief Guide to Teaching Adult Learners and A Brief Guide to Teaching Millennial Learners. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brad Garner. Thank you so much. I am so pleased to be here today. But I must tell you, um, this whole thing about being a keynote speaker is a little unnerving for me. Um, because I, I think of myself more as a as a nightclub act. <laughs> so I hope we will be able to discern the difference that it's actually sure kind of interesting to work here. Let me see what I can do with my yeah, all right. Now, one of the things that I believe is that when you get a group of people in a room, amazing things can happen. Energy can be created. I want to do a little science experiment today to, to prove that to you. So what you'll need to do is if you have anything on your lap, just put it on the floor for the moment underneath your seat. I'm going to give you some directions, and to keep making this work is you have to follow my directions exactly as I give them. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'm going to count to three, and when I count to three, I'd like you to stand up as quickly as you can, and that's key, and I'd like you to clap your hands exactly 25 times. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Works every time. <laughs> I can call on my wife and say, how are you doing today? Oh, got okay, another standing ovation. So, here we go. Um, as was mentioned, I, I write this newsletter for the National Resource Center. Uh, it comes out six times a year. It's free. Um, and virtually everything I'm going to share with you today will be in a toolbox. So there's no reason to take notes. If you subscribe, you'll get a little email saying a new one's ready. And there you go. So please take advantage of that. Try to make it something that faculty can use right away in the classroom. Um, we live in a culture where assessment and learning outcomes are very important, so I want to share with you mine for today. Um, I've got some really cool PowerPoint slides. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they're so cool that I'm going to read them to you. <laughs> you seem to be that. Um, and I've used every animation possible to do that. It's sweet. And then finally, I want to fill the time that we have together with the sound of my voice. So. You can tell me how I did it one day. Seriously, I hope today um, you walk away with one idea. Some of the stuff I'm going to share, you're going to go, whoa, I could never do that. And that's OK. But I hope you find at least one thing you can say that on Monday, I'm going to try that in my classroom with my students. I just started this new job in July. And the people that I'm working with, um, part of our, our Center for Learning, Learning and Innovation, these folks design online courses for our students in our adult and professional studies program. They're people with instructional design background. And so I'm learning the principles of instructional design from their perspective. I, I was an education major, an elementary school teacher. That's where I started. Um, so a lot of the ways that they're describing learning makes sense to me, but nobody ever taught me about it. But the, the key thing that they always keep stressing is the importance of learning outcomes and how everything that we do in the classroom should directly connect with those learning outcomes. Um, and that's where everything starts. Now, a few years ago, um, Wiggins and Mackay, I had to find a way to use this slide. I loved it so much, so I had to figure out a way to use it. Uh, they described what they call the twin sins of traditional course design. And what I want, I'm going to describe these to you, and then I'd like you to think about, is that something I do? I can tell you I've done both of these and had to fight against them. The first one is 
activity-oriented design. Hands-on without being minds-on. And this is a problem for me, I will tell you. I'll learn about a new technique or strategy, and I'll think to myself, I've got to try that. And I never make the, the intermediate step of saying, OK, this is a good strategy, but does it connect with my learning outcomes? It just looks like fun, and I want to try it. So that's one of the, the sense. The second one is the tyranny of coverage. Marching through the textbook, page by page, marching through the PowerPoint slides, because I've got to deliver all of this content during the semester. So when you think about this term coverage, what does that really mean? Does it mean it's some, it's some assigned reading that I've given you? Does it mean that it's in, um, on a PowerPoint slide? Does it mean that it's on a PowerPoint slide and I write it out loud? Then can I check that off and say, yep, I covered that. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to talk to the people around you, just the person next to you or behind you or whatever, and talk for a moment about the level of which the twin sins kind of creep into your teaching sometimes. Take a minute and talk about that. students and faculty, um, because of the workload. And it looks like this quite often. Most of the professors I talk to and most of the courses that I've observed have an upward slant that the last several weeks of the semester is when most of the work occurs. Now, if you take this chart and multiply times five, that's what a student's facing every semester. So what I'd like you to think about is a different kind of perspective on course design over a semester. The idea of creating a, a rhythm such that every week is virtually the same. Now let me give you an example. 
Um, we did a pilot project this fall where we took one, four of our first year seminar classes um, that were for transfer students, and we did them in a blended format, a hybrid. The course normally meets Tuesday, Thursday. We met only on Tuesdays. The rest of the course was online. Wasn't quite sure how that was gonna work out. <coughs> Um, one of the odd things, the things that surprised me the most was the fact that this class that only met once a week had the greatest sense of community that I have ever experienced in my teaching. And the only thing I can attribute that to is the fact that they got to know each other online. That's their venue. And so when they came to class, they've already talked to people that they were in the class. Tremendous energy generated. The other thing we try to do is make every week the same. So we met on Tuesdays. Um, every Thursday there was a discussion forum and there was a prompt and some writing they had to do. Every Saturday they had to do a journal. Um, throughout the semester we had three tests, three papers. On weeks when we, when we had a paper or, or a test, I would substitute that for either the discussion board or the journal. So every week was the same. And they, they could anticipate that every week one after the other. So think about the, the ways in which you load your class. If you've got a big assignment you want students to finish by the end of the semester, chunk it. Have them do a draft. Have them do a revision. Have them do pieces of that paper. So it's not all piling up that last week of the semester. So then we think about, okay, how do we deliver the goods in the classroom? How do we go about teaching? Um, the way that I think about it came from this article. Um, the bookshelf model, the idea being that if you have a 60-minute class, let's say, you begin that class with what they call an advanced organizer. And that's, um, you think about a movie trailer, uh, very popular around Academy Award time, all these movie trailers coming out. Um, they, they pick the best 15 or 20 seconds of that, that film, and they put those together in such a way that you say, I'd like to see that. So that's what an advanced organizer is. You set the stage for what's gonna happen during that class. It could be a video clip, it could be a provocative question, it could be a picture, it could be a quote, it could be something from the news, but it sets the stage for the class. Then you go from there to interspersing lectures or videos or demonstrations with times of discussion. And I wanna point out a couple of things, one, um, those discussion periods need to be intentional. If you're going to have discussion questions, you need to think about them before you go into class. And think about what you're trying to accomplish by that discussion. It's not a time filler. It's not a break. It's, it's an intentional way of processing the information. Another way to think about this is something called the rule of 10 and 2. The idea here being, for every 10 minutes that I talk, I'm going to create an opportunity for you to talk with your, your colleagues or classmates about the, the content that we're covering. So you go through that process, and then they suggest that at the end of the class, you have something called a cohesion builder. The idea being here that you, students have come to class with this box, you fill it full of stuff, principles, ideas, concepts. The cohesion builder wraps that box up and puts a bow on it. So when the students walk out, they know in their heads, these are the top five things that we learned today. Now, not everything we say in class is quotable or memorable, but we all have little talking points and we want them to remember. That's what goes in the box. So instead of saying, see you on Monday, or we'll pick it up next time we get together, you again put a discussion activity or a writing activity at the end of the class, a one minute essay, where they capture the things that we're talking about during that class and take them out the door with them. Um, <coughs> There was a time in my life when I, my aspiration was to be a stand-up comic. I know what you're thinking. Good thing you didn't choose that as a career. Um, but the first time I went to an amateur night at a comedy club, I boldly walked up to the desk and I signed my name and the guy behind the desk, I said, how much time do I have? He said, well, how much time do you think you're gonna need? And I said, I've got uh, probably 30 minutes worth of material. And under his breath, you could hear him say, you'll be lucky if you have 30 seconds. Um, so think about a semester. 
one of the beauties of teaching is we can try stuff out all during the semester, and some of the things that we, we try work, and some of the things that we try fall flat on their face. And you know what? The next semester, we can use that data to make adjustments. Some days I walk out of the classroom and I think to myself, you have no business being a teacher. You are stealing their money. This was awful. Other days I walk out and go, woo, I'm awesome. So I learned that this, my philosophy on this was affirmed during the Super Bowl, actually. A bunch of it's only weird if it doesn't work, okay? So that's kind of how I decide what I do in the classroom. Um, and things that don't work, I get rid of them. So how do, we, how do we go about doing that? One of the ways to think about this is welcoming your students into the classroom. If I walk into your room, um, how do I know that you're glad to see me? One way would be that you know me by name. You look at me and you recognize me, you call me by name. Now that takes some effort and work, but I think it's, a, it's well worth the effort if we can do that. Another thing that I do in, in classes typically is to have music play. Um, and one of the greatest compliments about teaching that my students can ever give me is, can I get a copy of that playlist? I love to pick out music and play, and I will turn that over to students to create playlists. I had a student say one time, um, you don't have any rap music as part of your playlist. I said, yeah, what's your point? Um, <laughs> um, I said, but why don't you make one for us? So he did. Now, I will not allow country western in the classroom. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not an option. But music playing says when you come in the room, this person's ready for us. This class is ready to go. Um, the other thing that I've discovered with all due respect to Sir Isaac Newton, discoverer of the fig Newton, is what I call the fourth law of motion. <coughs> the idea being and the base keeps running, running, that you have students sitting in a classroom and running, running, and running, running, and running, running, and running, and running, and running, they're more likely to stay that way. But if you start the class with something that gets people talking, they are more likely to continue to engage in conversation over the course of that session. So let me just show you some of the cheesy things that I do. Um, oh, this one. I'm going to put a word on the screen. And as soon as you recognize the word, I'd like you to say it out loud. Ready? One, two, three. Now, if you're sitting next to someone who initially said evil, I would suggest you change seats right now. <laughs> I will also do this. Um, celebrity of the day. Cheese factor is pretty high on this one. Um, but I will insert video or slides like this um, <laughs> and have celebrities ask a question, introduce the topic for the day. Now, the next slide I'm going to show you is my favorite. When I sat at home and made this, I laughed out loud. Fortunately, nobody was home at the time. But I call this one the M&M's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, how about this one? I'm going to show you a slide. You have a choice to make. I'm going to count to three. Turn to the person next to you and tell them your choice. Would you rather have diarrhea for 12 hours or a slurpy headache for 12 hours? Ready? One, two, three, tell your partner. Just notice who they are. <laughs> and here's another one that I tried. You know, think about it in a semester, you're not only teaching a first year seminar, but doing other stuff, right? Teaching other classes. And so you may have 150 or more students that you cross paths with every week. And it's, it's hard to remember who people are. That's, that takes some practice. So one of the things that I've told my students in the very first class is this. If you see me on campus, if you see me in the community somewhere, I would like you to come up to me and introduce yourself. Tell me who you are and tell me the class that you're in. So we can at least begin to make a connection. It's amazing how often they do that. I'll be at Walmart, somebody will walk up, introduce themselves, I'm in your class, we talk for a few minutes. 
And there's a connection made there that, that carries over into the classroom. Quick and easy strategy. Um, I, I like this slide when I made it, but it looks like a massage parlor. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you make your classroom safe? How do you make it a place where people can make mistakes? People can say stupid things. Uh, people can try out new ideas. Take a position on a topic just to see if it works. What I'd like you to do now is talk to your partners about how you make your classroom safe in a place that these things can happen. Okay? Talk to the people around you.
Twitter is like microblogging, then that would totally make us nanoblogging. Zach and I were sophomores at the time at Stanford when we came up with the idea. Everyone was starting to Twitter and we were thinking, you know, what's the next big thing? Can we take this to another level? And that's when we dropped out and started Flutter. I think a lot of people don't have time to Twitter. Uh, it just takes too long to compose a message with 140 characters and then start getting bombarded by a few tweets and it's like hundreds of characters that you have to read. We limit our users' posts or flaps is what we like to call them because it's like uh, hummingbirds' wings flapping, which is like really fast, which is like, you know, faster than a regular bird tweets. Uh, we limit it to 26 characters, so one full English alphabet is the maximum. So, Flutter can also take posts from all sorts of sites, Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, I guess, and it automatically shortens them to 26 characters. Like, let's say my friend tweets something like, working on some new designs for the album cover and watching Project Runway in my underwear, lol. Let's see what Flutter comes up with. <laughs> Just about character limit either. I mean, we are working on ways to fully integrate Flutter into your daily life, so you hardly even have to think about what you're posting. We're developing an iPhone app that allows Flutter to know where you are at any given moment and then flaps automatically. So let's say Kim is walking down 9th Avenue and decides to go to a Starbucks. The moment she walks in the door, her Flutter account will automatically update to say, Kim get coffee. Now let's say after that soy latte, nature calls. Then. Flutter will update to say, Kim in bathroom. I think it's awesome. I was getting really annoyed with how long it was taking to read everything on Twitter. And I mean, type of fast, you know? Sometimes by the time I'd be reading a twit, at the end of it, it'd be old and irrelevant. That's not gonna happen with Flutter because you can read it all with a glance. Plus they're coming out with Flutter eyes. Flutter eyes are a pair of highly sophisticated eyeglasses we've developed, which we think will revolutionize mobile blocking. They connect to a wireless network that is going to the right thing on the inside of the lenses, which shows scrolling flats from all your favorite flutters. The great thing is they look like normal glasses to anyone else. <laughs> I can see it really taking over the world of nano blogging. Which I guess didn't even really exist until Flutter. We already have 3.8 million users worldwide, and that's after only two months. Now, We've had a lot of interest from ad agencies and we're strongly considering putting advertisements within people's messages. Vowels, yeah, we toyed around with the idea of just losing vowels altogether from Flutter, but then our intern Laura pointed out that it would be difficult for people to represent themselves in the first person. Because like, at first I was all, you know, there's no I in nanoblogging, but yeah, there is. And we told them to keep the vowels I plan on starting my own site once I can cash in on Flutter. Ten characters, no vowels. Electronic diodes transmitting posts directly to the brain. I plan on calling it Shutter without the vowels. Okay, so watch for that coming your way. So think about technology. It's not an end in itself. It's, it's a means to an end. It gets you from one place to the other. It helps your students accomplish the learning outcomes that you've identified for your course. PowerPoint is probably the most popular uh, form of technology that faculty use, and I would suggest that most faculty use it very poorly. Now, I, I, as an example of that, go to a conference sometime, walk down the hall, and look into the rooms, and what you'll see are an abundance of slides with bullet points. And you will actually see people at conferences, teaching and learning conferences or whatever, reading the slides to their participants. To me, that is a sin. So think about PowerPoint as being an agenda and not a script. Use pictures, use something that prompts you to talk about something, and then move on. But let's look at some other forms of technology. I ran across this, and if you just Google Bloom's Taxonomy and Technology, um, these are some amazing sites that connect directly with the various levels in Bloom's taxonomy. So just Google it and take, visit some of those. Um, then we have the whole area of social media, which has become so very abundant in our culture. I'd like you to take a minute and talk to the people around you about your thoughts and feelings about 
the role of social media in higher education in the 21st century. Talk about that. Pros and cons.
their world of social media. So if they want to choose to like our organization or follow us, that's fine. If they don't want to be our friends. Okay. And that's cool because I don't want to be there. So. <laughs> <laughs> then that's, that's a question to think about. How, how do you allow your students to be your friends? Um, it's also like, I love my grandma, but I don't want to see her on Facebook. <laughs> And I, I don't know how effectively you could use any of these things if you don't use them yourself in your daily life. Good point. And you don't use any of these, so I can imagine attempting <coughs> to use it. Okay. Or in Good a point. There is a learning curve to learn how to apply some of these things in, in the classroom. Um, another one, of course, would be a, uh, the wiki, which, whoops, back to that, yep, um, that can be done asynchronously. The group students, they can work on documents, you can track changes, um, and they can work from home or wherever, and then the product is completed, and then you can do peer reviews that way, so using that strategy, or using discussion forums or class blogs, um, where students are given a prompt and then asked to um, share their thoughts and then respond to the thoughts of three classmates. And one of the things that we're finding is, and I don't know if there's a direct correlation here, but the writing that the students do in these discussion boards is more in-depth and more thoughtful than we have seen in a while. And we think one of the reasons for that is, if you think about writing a research paper, for example, and you submit it, who are the two people who typically see that research paper? The students and the faculty member. In this, in this venue, I'm putting my thoughts out there for my friends and classmates to see, and it's going to be there for a while. So I want to carefully craft what I say, because I also know that what I say is up for grabs. People can respond to it. People can disagree with me. So just, again, another way of just integrating that technology into the flow of the classroom. Now here's another one. Um, let me show you how to pronounce that word actually. slides long and each slide shows for 20 seconds. So you could have students create this in an iMovie format, you could have them do it in class, um, but th these rules apply. You could also add rules like you can only use 20 words over the slide, so use pictures and illustrations and other things to in invite our thinking. It, it forces the students to take what they're learning and put it into a unique context. How can I summarize this concept, this principle, these ideas? in 20 slides and only six minutes and 40 seconds long. That's the other beauty of it. They're only six minutes and 40 seconds long. <laughs> so you have some idea of that. Um, another one is Blogster. Blogster is a free site. Um, and there you create electronic posters. So this one, for example, about physics and how things work, includes pictures, words, and as you, if you look in there, you can see um, four or five or six video clips that are inserted into this electronic poster. So again, students can, can create these on Blogster for free, and then you can put them up for peer review. Again, that's another way of forcing them to take the content into a new venue. This is one we're gonna do this year for our first year seminar, have students create a Blogster about themselves in the first week of class who they are, where they're from, their favorite quote, what they like to do in their spare time, their favorite book, their favorite movie, whatever those things might be. And again, a way of creating that, that interaction. Um, Mendeley is another freebie. And this, this you might be interested in as faculty members, but also would be available to your students. You can download Mendeley onto your desktop. And it serves as a storage place for references and resources. 
So you drag and drop PDF copies of articles, for example. It organizes them alphabetically. You can do a word search to that list of, of articles. And you can drag and drop and do APA bibliographic citations. It's free. So I would encourage you to take advantage of it and also introduce your students to it. It's a great way to organize your research references, resources. Using film is another thing to think about. Um, there are some great movies out there. And my contention would be that a movie creates a unique way for students to process content. Because you have characters who are dealing with struggles and issues and decisions they have to make. They make those decisions and then there are consequences. So it, 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 it puts you into that environment and, and forces you to think about some things in a different way. Um, the, the rules on this, as I understand it, are that if you want to show a full-length feature film as part of your class, so you get your students together someplace and you watch a film and eat popcorn or whatever you might do, um, as long as it's in your syllabus um, and the only people participating are the people in your class, then you can do it without paying any kind of royalties. So, um, something to think about. Music is another one. Um, I'm a big believer in um, finding ways to use music in the classroom. Um, a friend of mine this year taught a philosophy class, and the assignment was to take the new Mumford & Sons Babel CD and analyze the songs and create a presentation about the, the philosophy being presented on that CD. And again, there, there are other things you can do with music. Lyrics, for example. Um, a song by Lou Reed, The Dirty Boulevard. It talks about um, living in poverty. Um, a song by Ben Queller that talks about a young man who is homeless. Any better society that talks about how we are wasteful and how we accumulate things. So again, use the song, use the lyrics, use the music that they're listening to, and, and have them do some analysis of that, some writing, some conversations about what's being offered within those songs. We have a green. Another option to think about are screencasts. Um, there are free sites online, uh, screener.com, screencast, Omatic.com, where you can go on, sit at your desk, put the camera on your computer, and make a brief video. And then you can save that, and you can insert it in your learning management system. You can send a link to your students. Um, some people I know will do weekly announcements, and they will just put those out there, send, email those to their students, and like, here's what we're going to be doing this week. They don't have to be polished or of excellent quality. They're just a connecting point that you're making between you as a person and your students. The other way you can use this is, if, for example, if you're going to be at a conference and you're going to have to miss class, take your PowerPoint slides and make a screencast. And then post it on your learning management system or send your students a link. So they're still getting an opportunity to engage with the content even though you're not going to be there. And they can watch it at their leisure. They can watch it on their phone, they can watch it on their tablet, they can watch it on their computer. Um, video clips, and this is, any, any librarians in the room? Oh. Um, <laughs> let's, let's watch your face as I describe this, okay? We'll use that as our measure. Um, there are, are tons of video clips on, online. Um, my personal opinion, and I will hold this until I am convicted of this crime, is that um, I, I capture videos from YouTube and other places and store them on my computer for insertion into PowerPoint. Rather than using internet, rather than going to a website, doing that during class, I will insert them. Now there are different opinions on that, I think, among librarians. I, I only listen to the people who say, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. All right, so you heard it. I like her. Um, again, a great tool. Now, one of the best sites, in my opinion, is TED Talks. Yes. I want to show you one that we use as a discussion prompt. Imagine, if you will, a gift. I'd like for you to picture.
picture it in your mind. It's not too big, about the size of a golf ball. So envision what it looks like all wrapped up. But before I show you what's inside, I will tell you it's going to do incredible things for you. It will bring all of your family together. You will feel loved and appreciated like never before and reconnect with friends and acquaintances you haven't heard from in years. Adoration and admiration will overwhelm you. It will recalibrate what's most important in your life. It will redefine your sense of spirituality and faith. You'll have a new understanding and trust in your body. You'll have unsurpassed vitality and energy. You'll expand your vocabulary, meet new people, and you'll have a healthier lifestyle. And get this, you'll have an eight-week vacation of doing absolutely nothing. You'll eat countless gourmet meals. Flowers will arrive by the truckload. People will say to you, you look great. Have you had any work done? And you'll have a lifetime supply of good drugs. You'll be challenged, inspired, motivated, and humbled. Your life will have new meaning. Peace, health, serenity, happiness. Nirvana. The price, $55,000, and that's an incredible deal. By now, I know you're dying to know what it is and where you can get one. Does Amazon carry it? Does it have the Apple logo on it? Is there a waiting list? Not likely. This gift came to me about five months ago and looked more like this when it was all wrapped up. Not quite so pretty. And this. And then this. It was a rare gem, a brain tumor. Hemangioblastoma. The gift that keeps on giving. And while I'm okay now, I wouldn't wish this gift for you. I'm not sure you'd want it, but it wouldn't change my experience. It profoundly altered my life in ways I didn't expect, in all the ways I just shared with you. So the next time you're faced with something that's unexpected, unwanted, and uncertain, consider that it just may be a gift. So in journal formats, I'm the only one who sees what they're writing. And the question was, what have been some of the gifts in your life? Be amazing, amazed how transparent students became in that environment and how then I got to know them a little better right away based upon their journeys. The beauty of TED Talks is that there are topical videos on virtually everything. Now, and you have to screen them, you have to look at them, you have to say, does this really connect with learning outcomes? Um, but again, another, another great resource. Um, another one is the idea of building relationships. You all know this as first year seminar folks. I love this picture. This is actually my Facebook picture. So, um, I haven't had many friends lately, but you know, that's okay. That's all right. I like that. So, how do we build relationships? I recently went to a conference and heard this gentleman speak. Uh, the author of this book, Teaching Naked. And think about his concept. His idea is that we should move technology out of the classroom. That we should begin using some of these strategies to, to invite students to learn outside of class and to connect with them outside of class. The email guarantee, for example, is he says the first day of class with students, if you email me, I guarantee you that I will respond within 24 hours. That says something. Your emails are important to me, and I'm going to read them. And if you have a question, I'm going to try to answer it. Um, also uses the screencast announcements I described, creating Facebook groups. And again, depending on your level of comfort or technological skill, you can pick a couple of these and try them out. Now this one is my favorite. Um, one of the things that we did last semester in this, this hybrid blended format that we taught was that we required every student in the class to meet with us face-to-face, one-on-one. 
And it, it takes time. It's an investment. You take 30 minutes times the number of students you have over a period of time. It takes some time. But the benefits have been greater than I would ever imagine. Because it, and it's very odd, but the next time that student walks in the classroom, the one you just met with, and you have eye contact, there's a different level of connection than I've experienced in my teaching. We, we know each other now. It's not just a face in the group or an ID number or a set of test scores. I kind of know their journey. And they know more about me. So it creates a connection. And the other thing that's very interesting is now that I see those same students after the class is over, that connection has continued. They, they make contact with me. I see them and there's something different about us seeing each other and talking. So consider it. Um, the other thing to think about is um, embracing uncertainty. Helping our students think through the idea that there aren't always correct answers or good answers to everything. Sometimes you have to pick between two really crappy alternatives. Um, so I love this quote that talks about the idea of holding two opposing ideas in our mind at the same time. Um, we're going we're gonna to think about topics and issues that really don't have solid, correct, direct answers to them. And choices that we pick may have certain consequences that we don't like. So um, one of the things that we've been infusing into our first year seminar are problem-based learning tasks. So for example, um, this, this is a true story, and there are, there are some videos on YouTube about this man who was 62, year old, 62 years old, diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. Doctors couldn't tell him how long he was going to live, but probably less than six months, and it would be a horrifying death. So he put forth the idea, why don't you kill me now and take my organs and give them to somebody else? Interesting idea, but also fraught with political questions, economic questions, philosophical questions. So again, having students wrestle with this idea. Um, creation and evolution, a uh, topic that pops up from time to time. You're a member of a school board, and you can provide some textbooks and say, okay, which one of these are you going to pick and why? Um, the city has an opportunity to, to make some money because um, we're going to put a hazardous waste storage dump in the community. It has some risks attached. How do you weigh those? So as you think about your own disciplines and how they might connect with these various stories, uh, fast food, again, a windfall financially, not necessarily in the best interest of the students in terms of health. Um, the university decided to ban Facebook and create their own social media network within their own, own constructs. What would that look like? And how would you feel about that if you knew somebody was really watching? And oh, by the way, somebody is really watching. Um, Shakespeare, have them take a Shakespearean play and rewrite it into a 21st century urban setting. Recreate the story. Write a script for it. Have them perform it. Have them make a movie about it. Now, this last one I'm going to show you is uh, kind of a problem-based learning task on steroids. Do you use the CLA? There's a, a test called the Collegiate Learning Assessment that looks at critical thinking and the level at which is a value added in, in various universities. Um, and you have freshmen take it and seniors take it and you can plot the level at which you are actually contributing to the student's level of critical thinking. One of the people involved in that is a guy named Mark Chun, and he created this, this idea of performance tasks. I'm going to show you the one that I created. A little context for this. We are a faith-based institution, so you'll see that kind of in this, this example I'm going to give you. And many of our students come to our campus espousing their faith, talking about their, their Christianity. And the reality is what they're espousing is what their, their parents believe. Many of them don't really own it, but they know the right answer to everything. So when you ask them, oh, I know the answer to that, um, they don't really own it yet. So this was a, a, a chance to kind of knock them off balance a little bit. The idea is, um, you create 
that, and again, the, the issue of we have to make some decisions about who gets money. We only have $5 million to give away. We have 20 positions that we can fund. How are we going to distribute those? And so here are the six organizations and their requests. And then they receive um, six proposals, one from each of the agencies. And as we go through these, you'll see how they each have their own little wrinkles that they have to cope with. The first one is um, the Islamic Relief Society that only provides services to Islamic families who have been affected by war. The second, um, and this is the, the one that gets them, um, this is probably the most Christian of the organization uh, because throughout the, the proposal, the, the writer says, praise Jesus, but when you look at the proposal, they don't ever really tell you what they're gonna do with the money. Just like, we're gonna do some good stuff with this. And they fall for that. Um, and then Free at Last is an organization that helps people in prison and after they get out of prison. Uh, Wheels is an organization that creates transportation systems for people with disabilities. One of the unique features of this proposal is that they, in their proposal, say, in two other cities, Louisville, Kentucky, and Cincinnati, we have created transportation systems. And with the seed money we were provided, the system was self-supporting within three years. Um, we'd like to do that in Indianapolis. That's the proposal we're making. Uh, the African AIDS Society deals with the HIV AIDS epidemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. And Prevention and Preparation is an organization that uh, provides information about birth control but does not do abortions. So they have to wrestle with this and figure out where should the money go. Now a couple other things that we do, there's a proposal. Uh, some of these things I just got from Google, some of them I just made up, the data. Um, they also then get a, an audit letter from Julie Sheet at the half. Can you please just dance in the house? Um, and, and in this audit letter it says, love abounds is not a good risk. They have some issues financially. Now, they have to write, as the final product, write a memo to the Board of Trustees describing what it is that they're going to do with the money and why. They also have to do a five-slide PowerPoint presentation for the Board of Trustees meeting. Those are the two products. Um, and to give you an example of how creative students can be, one student proposed that they were going to take two of the available 20 positions and actually give them to Love Abounds, the one that's financially in trouble. But the role of those two people they were going to give was to help them to get their books in order, help them to figure out their accounting problems. But that was a very clever thought and process. Um, I also create a blog. And fortunately, I have multiple personalities. So I'm able to play the role of the executive director of each of these six agencies. I give them names. I, give, I, I post a picture of what that person looks like and tell them, if you have questions, as you read these proposals, go to the blog and ask the director. And then I respond. Um, and I tell them, keep watching the blog, because new information is going to be emerging all the time. And then the other thing we did was set a deadline. And we said, if you do not have your memo in and your PowerPoint presentation in by 8 o'clock on this Friday, you automatically lose 50% of the points. Just like work, right? Somebody says, I want that memo by Friday, you get it done by Friday. So that, that, that was a tremendous response rate emerged. So we, we give them the rubric up front and show them exactly what we're expecting. That's a performance task. It took a while to do it. But students totally engaged with this, this idea in, in this process. I'm almost done. Um, but think about assessment. I would encourage you to assess your students early and often. One of the things that bothers me the most is to talk to students around midterm, and they say, yeah, I'm getting a D in that class. Well, why is that? Well, because I didn't do well on the test. One test in the first eight weeks of the class. That's ridiculous. We should have assessment activities going on every single week and there's another side to that. We also need to grade that stuff. We also need to let students know how they're doing. Um, I have access to lots of classes in our Blackboard system, and I'm appalled by going in and seeing all these markings and the <coughs> assignments have been submitted, but they have not been graded. 
What's the point? So often and greater. Uh, imagine this. Imagine we're going to have a buffet today for lunch, okay? It's free, but we're going to have a buffet. So what I'm going to do is at the end of the line, I'm going to take a picture of your plate. I'm not going to put your name on it, just a picture of your plate. We're going to post them on the wall. It is very likely that all of those plates would look very different, right? Because some of the stuff on that buffet, you think, I never get this at home. I'm going to have a lot of this, or that's my favorite food, or I'm going to eat all desserts, or whatever that might be. All, all different. So what, what about the idea of allowing our students to learn differently? So in this scenario, for example, um, everybody's going to take the midterm and the final. Everybody's going to take the, the weekly reading quizzes. Everybody's going to keep a journal. That's 500 points out of 1,000. What I would like you to do as a student is tell me how you're going to earn the other 500 points. So I've created a menu here, um, interviewing people in the field that, in which the student's preparing, uh, doing a research paper, reviewing some videos, uh, doing some community service, um, developing a resource notebook. I have a list of, of supplementary books that may be fiction or nonfiction. Read those books, relate them to the content that we're reading. Students decide how they're going to earn those 500 points. And they declare that. Um, the other thing that I do, and this, is a, this can apply to any class. Um, imagine, if you will, that you have three assignments due in a semester. A paper, a presentation, and some kind of project. Now, imagine it's the 14th week of the semester, you have 30 students who have submitted research papers to you. How do you feel when you get to number 11? <laughs> or number 14? Or number 26? Get this over with. So what I do instead is create hand in dates. And I say, October 4th, November 5th, December 4th are hand in dates. On those three dates, you have to hand in something. I don't care which of the three things it is, but something has to be handed in. And oddly, they distribute themselves relatively evenly. So I'm not reading 30 research papers, I'm only reading 10. I'm looking at 10 projects and 10 presentations, and it makes it better for me as a grader. It also makes it better for the students, because they are making decisions about the order in which they do things. Some of them will say, oh, this one's easy, I'm gonna do that now. Others will think, that's easy. I'm going to save that to week 14 because I've got a lot of other stuff to do that week. So it gives them greater control again over their own learning. So as a, as a final activity today, um, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to turn to your partner or the people that you're been talking with and share one other idea that you use in your teaching that has been successful in terms of your reaching students and helping them achieve their learning outcomes. That's how we'll close today. Thank you. So talk to your partners for a couple of minutes. Or how did you how about the library? Well, I don't know. I don't know, like I feel like a transition into even more time or something. That's like totally different for them to like. Well, which would be an interesting question because they would have older you know, relatives who may be going through that. So, what are they going through? Right? Yeah. How, how are you guys, you know, what are ways you can identify with that process? And maybe even connect with them by talking about your own. Yeah. Or, or, or maybe even talking about the process and maybe even talking about the process. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that they feel like they have to have yeah, the sense of accomplishment that things are taken care of. Yeah, so right. and, and so I think it's helpful to take them back and say, it's okay to talk about the fear, right? Yeah. Like the whole part of you does matter here, and we do want to hear it. You know, how you're using that, how you're drawing upon that. Um, so I think to open it up that way would be really powerful. Because I do worry when they come in and I, you know, this, you know, they're just... I mean, we were just talking about this, the connection between 103, 204, 220, so, yeah. and 320 this week, the last week, whatever. And just thinking about how that you could have those students do the EPP, 103, and 204. It'll be site gateway.uc.iupui.edu. And of course, I've sent out a few invitations, but um, come, enjoy, and we'll have a great time together. You have affirmed for, for me one of my most basic beliefs about higher education, and that is that first year seminar people are the best people. Do you agree? It has been an honor and a privilege to be here with you here today, and I have learned some things that I'm going to steal and use, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to, to close today with a story, um, and it's a story of, of a rabbi who was talking to God. And God asked the rabbi if he would like to see what heaven and hell were like. And the rabbi got very excited about that and said, of course I would. He said, well, come with me. So they walked down a hallway. And at the end of the hallway was a large door. And as they approached the door, the rabbi could hear some sounds coming from the other side. He was a little nervous about what he was going to see because he heard people screaming and moaning and just they appeared to be in great pain, and he was not sure what kind of pain and what he was going to see. But God waved his arms and opened the door, and the rabbi looked inside and saw a rather unusual sight. He saw a large round table, and seated around this table were a group of people who were emaciated, uh, in great pain and agony. You could tell they hadn't eaten for a long time. And in the middle of the table, was a large pot of stew. And even as the doors opened, the rabbi could smell the fragrance of the stew, the meat and the vegetables and the sauce. And people seated around the table had these long spoons. And to make their agony even worse, the spoons were long enough to reach into the stew, but they were so long that they couldn't get the food into their mouths. So, the rabbi watched for a moment and couldn't take it anymore and ran out of the room. And God said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let me show you what heaven's like. So they walked down another hallway. And at the end of this hallway was a large door, just like the other one. But as they approached this door, he could hear people singing and laughing. And it sounded like a great party was going on on the other side of that door. So God waved his hands and the door opened. 
the rabbi looked inside, and again, he was surprised by the fact that he saw a group of people who seemed very healthy and happy, and they were having a great time joking and laughing and singing. But he also noticed that there was a pot of stew in the middle of the table. And all of the people at that, around the table also had these long spoons. So he asked God, what's the difference between heaven and hell? And the answer was, in heaven, people have learned how to feed each other. So my encouragement to you is to continue to be fed and feed one another and do the same thing for your students.